I want to welcome every single person, especially those of you that are here for the first time. My name is Tim, lead pastor here, and we're just honored that you're here. I want to look in the camera and welcome our Global X fam. Can you all help me just welcome everybody? Do you know people tune in all over the country, all over the place? I think people are in Australia are watching right now. No, I don't know. I'll make that up, but maybe they are. We don't know. Uh, I don't even know what time it is in Australia, so I'm not even sure if they're awake. But I'm glad that you're here, and if you are new with us, uh, you're kind of catching us on a really, really, if I could just say, important series of conversations that we're having right now. Because we believe that there is a part of all of us that is often overlooked in life that matters maybe far more than we ever could imagine, and that's the soul. And so what we're doing is we're kind of on a journey where we're kind of like saying, you know what, let's do some work on the soul. Now, if you weren't here last week, can, I'll just fill you in with just one really important truth that we, we really needed to get in our minds to understand. Foundational thing we need, to, we need to grapple with. And it is this thought that your spiritual maturity will always be limited by your emotional maturity. Let me say it again. Your spiritual maturity or your spiritual growth, let me say it that way, will always be limited by your emotional maturity. Why is this so important? I heard from so many people last week, if I could be honest, that just told me how much the message resonated with them. And partially because if you were like me and you grew up in and around the church, the only thing you ever heard talked about was spiritual maturity, spiritual growth. And and a lot of times what we've done in the church is we've ignored the other aspects of who we are. Like the physical, you, you rarely hear a message where a, a pastor is going to get up and go, you need to get in shape. You need to get your cholesterol down. You need to get your heart pumping more. You, you're never going to hear that in the church because we don't talk about that. We, we, we also don't talk about the emotional, the soul. We don't talk about a lot of those things. We focus on the spiritual, and what we've done a lot of times is we've tried to address emotional or soul deficiencies with spiritual practices. We say, hey, you just need to read the Bible more. You just need to pray more. You need to attend church more. Like, this is the answer to all of our problems. The truth is, there are things deep in the soul that we need to wrestle with. That we need to allow God to come in and touch our soul, to heal our soul, and to allow us to become all that God wants us to be. Now, last week, we kind of also tagged on and introduced a resource for you. I wanted to come and mention it today. It's a book called Emotional, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a book by Pete Scazzaro. And it's something that has really helped our staff. It's helped me. In fact, he's got a whole litany of books in this series. And I just want to encourage you, we, we practically sold out last week at the shop. And so uh, if you want, we've got more, we've refreshed it. I would encourage you, if this is something that's kind of resonating with you, you need to go on a journey, not just the messages, but these are books and things I've read that God has used to really kind of speak into my soul and to allow me to get to a place of, of health. And so I want to encourage you, pick this up. And oh, by the way, one of the things you'll discover with Pete Scazzaro and some of his books, I, I was reading one of his other books and uh, in it, he developed an assessment to kind of figure out where you are emotionally when it comes to your soul, your maturity. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to take this, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm no spring chicken, and uh, I've been around the block, and I'm, I'm pretty well-rounded. And, and so I took this assessment. I took this test. And you know what I discovered? You know what you want to know about your pastor? Is that I found out that I'm an emotional teenager, I'm an emotional adolescent. That's what I found out. There were some areas that I did not score so well when I took the assessment. And so if that scares you, if some of you are new going, oh, my gosh, I told you we shouldn't have visited that church. I got to go somewhere where the pastor's a little bit further along emotionally. I get it, okay? We, we say we're all on journey. No one's perfect here. And so if you're on our mailing list, we'll send out a link uh, this week. So maybe you want to take the test, and you, you might be further along than I am. There's probably a lot of you further along than I am, Okay. And so we're, we're just diving deep into the soul. Today I want to talk about something that I have seen impact our soul maybe as much as anything else I've witnessed in life. It's this idea that we are living in a comparison culture. 
I don't think we even realize the impact of living in a comparison culture. And here's what I found that I do. Here's what I found I think that a lot of us do is that we don't love ourselves that much because we're always comparing the real you with everyone else's filtered life. You ever felt like I'm not enough? You ever felt like I I just don't measure up? Have you ever felt like I wish I were more like her? I wish I was more like him? It's because what we see in the morning when we look in the mirror and we go, oh, is not the same person that we portray to everyone else, is it? What you see when you show up on a Sunday, okay, at 930, is me after I've gotten myself cleaned up, ready, and presented myself the best I possibly can. What what I'm saying is that we all know the real us. I'm not talking about the physical now. I'm talking about your soul. But what we're doing is we're living in a state where we're constantly comparing ourselves to everyone else. And can I just say social media has not helped this cause. We all know that. Social media, all we do is we sit there and we scroll and we look at everybody else's perfect life. And no wonder we feel like I'm a terrible mom, I'm a terrible dad, or like I'm not, I don't have a lot of followers, I'm not a great influencer, I don't really have much. Like it's because we've done nothing but compare the real us, the broken us, the messed up parts with everybody else's perfectly filtered life. And you know, you should know this. What you see on Instagram is not real. You know that, right? It's not real. It's been posed and filtered, and like, it's funny, um, just recently we were on a, uh, we took a little trip, my wife and I and and, uh, another couple from the church, we took a a short vacation, we went to the beach for a few days, and uh, I remember this one day, we're sitting there in front of this beach, gorgeous setting, beautiful, right, and we all look over, and right at the shore's edge, there were four young ladies who for the next hour and a half, all took pictures of each other posing in front of the water. And they're helping each other with their poses. Do this, and this, and this. I'm I'm not lying, I swear to you. And we could not stop watching as all four of them took pictures in group. Okay, now you stand like that. Now let me get down low and let's get that. No, that's like a, let me get up here. And an hour and a half straight, they took pictures for each other on everybody's phones. Why? So that they could have something to post. And the reason why we feel like we don't measure up is because everybody's pictures are just absolutely perfect. People online, you need to know this, only give you or show you the representation they want you to see. Like, like I, I do this too. I mean, I, I haven't been on social media this year. It's kind of my new goal for this year. I've got someone that manages my account, so uh, you just can know that. I, I felt like I, for my own soul, I need to get away. But, but uh, I would do this thing. You know there's these filters you can download with Instagram where these like games and things that you can download and play. Have you ever seen people do those? And so they had these filters that I would come across where you could download it and then take video of yourself and a box will show up on top of your head and it'll ask you trivia questions. You know, all these different trivia questions, right? And so I, did, this is what, can I just, confession time, this is what I would do? i download those. And then I would record myself because, you know, pops up and you got so much time to answer it before you do it. And I would go through and I'd answer it. And as long as I got it right, I posted it. <laughs> but when I got it wrong, delete. Let's go get another one. And I only posted correct answers. You know why? Because I wanted you to think I'm smarter than I really am. See, that's how messed up I am. I'm an emotional teenager. Leave me alone. And and what we kind of joke about when it comes to social media, I think is actually just a kind of a superficial picture of what we actually all feel deep down inside. Because the truth is, and I can just be honest with you, that a lot of times my struggle is, and and really in life growing up, I always felt like I was not good enough. I always felt like I did not measure up. Let let me tell you why this is. Uh, I grew up with an older brother. And when you're smaller and you're weaker and not as smart. My older brother, he is, uh, he's brilliant. He is really, really smart. Like he got his genetic makeup from my mom mostly. My mom 
and my brother, my older brother, are just, like, we're talking about when it comes to IQ, they're, like, off the charts. Like, how many of ever, I don't know if you remember the SAT, everybody does the ACT. Like, they scored somewhere between 1,500 and 1,600 on their SATs, which, by the way, I think a 1,600 is near perfect. Okay? I won't even tell you what my SAT score was. So I grew up with an older brother who was bigger, he was stronger, and he was definitely smarter. He got straight A's through school, right? And uh, I just, I mean, I remember getting a, a, a C in home maintenance. Now, I just want you to know, I think I'm a solid B plus now. I was just a late bloomer. And so I don't know if you know what it's like growing up in the shadow of somebody else. I don't know if you know what it's like where, where you feel like you're always hidden because they're better than you were. And what happens is when we live in somebody else's shadow, we learn to, to suppress our weaknesses. We, we learn to filter our lives so that we kind of portray to everybody else, no, 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 I'm good at this, though. Like, no, I, I, I'm actually, I know, I, I'm smart too. And this is what we do, we do. And I don't know if you have ever felt jealous of other people. Have you ever felt jealous? Like, who hasn't felt jealous of other people? I feel jealous all the time. I'm jealous I can't sing like Tucker. I would love to be able to sing like Tucker, amen? I'm jealous I can't squat like Pastor Kevin. You don't want to squat next to him. The guy has, like, thighs like tree trunks and a back that is like an ox. The dude just... I don't, I won't work out with him. I, I, you know what I mean? I'm jealous that I can't, I can't fix cars like my dad. I, I can't fly planes like my brother. Like, I don't know if you've ever felt jealous in your life, but what most of us do is we're constantly measuring what it is that we can't do as well with others, and we live in the shadows, we filter our lives, and eventually we filter our soul. And what we've learned and what we've been told, let's be honest, in our culture is that you hide your weaknesses. That, that's the message that we've learned in school, at work, in life, on TV, hide your weaknesses, right? Come on, like, like, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to hide. You don't want anybody at work to know that you're struggling or you could, could affect your promotion capability. You, you don't want anybody in your family to know that inside you are actually breaking and falling apart because you're the dad or you're the mom and you're supposed to have it all together. So we're told hide our weaknesses. Guys, can I speak to guys for just a quick second? Men especially. We're told don't be emotional. That's the message we get. Hide your weaknesses. Be strong. Be resilient. Don't hide. Don't cry. Don't let anybody see that. That's a weakness. People will pounce on weaknesses if you show it. And women, I mean, I think, I think they're similar. And women, it's like, don't be too emotional. If you're too emotional, then, then I don't want to deal with you. And you're difficult. And, and so what, what have we learned? We've learned throughout our culture is hide your weaknesses Meanwhile, we're comparing our weaknesses with everybody else's filtered lives, and we get to a place where in our soul, we just, we put a filter on it. We're not living authentic lives. We're struggling, and we're going to hide our weaknesses. Now, when I say weaknesses, can I just say this? I'm not talking about our sin. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, you know when I say weaknesses? I'm talking about the things that you see in yourself that you say, I wish I had more of. It's the things that you look in your life and you go, but man, you know, she's a better mom. Man, he makes a lot more money than I do. Man, they have a better title than I do. And I just, I don't know, I'm not as smart. I'm not as good with that. I'm not good with my hands. I'm not, like, like I'm, not, I'm talking about those kind of weaknesses. You know, like, there are some people that are so gifted with their hands. I'm so jealous. They can, like, put anything together and they can, they can take electronics apart and put it back together and it actually still works. You know what I mean? I'm jealous of those people. And then there are some people that you should, you should not even put together Ikea furniture. That's not good for you. There are some people that are so gifted teaching others. There's some people that are so good with kids and patient. And then there's others who aren't and have no business. Do you know what I learned about myself? I'm one of those people that have no business teaching kids. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not lying. I, 
I tried to do something really clever. This was years and years ago when our church was small and I think we had maybe 70 people or something at it. We needed some people to serve in our kids' ministry because a lot of you are, you know, parents and you got your kids all week long and you're like, I just want to get away from kids for a little bit. And so I, I, I was like, okay, what are we going to do? I said, I got an idea. I'm going to bring somebody in to preach. And uh, I'm going to bring in, it was like, I'm going to try to find B-rate preaching, maybe C. I'm going to bring somebody in to preach, and I'm going to go teach the kids. So when everybody's in there going, where's Pastor Tim? Like, oh, he's teaching the kids. See, I was going to go show everybody how important it was and how valuable it was to teach the kids. And so that particular Sunday, I taught the older kids. And I want you to know, I did a really good job. I, I only made two of them cry. They have never asked me back in the kids' ministry ever again. Because I learned something about me. I'm not very good at it. Can I tell you my wife? My wife is great at it. She teaches your two-year-olds, your three-year-olds, and it takes a lot of patience. I'm just saying there's things in us that we look and we say, I'm not as good as that person at it. And what we've done is we're trying to hide our weaknesses and we display our strengths. Nobody posts It creates a TikTok that can't sing and dance. You you don't do that. You're you're going to create TikTok if you're good and you got rhythm and you got beat. What I'm saying is, is that we hide our weaknesses and we display our strengths for everybody else. Why? Because we're living in a world of constant comparison and it's crushing our soul. It's crushing it. If you got your Bible with you today, I want to show you how this plays out. There's something that God revealed to me that is so incredibly powerful. I'm going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. And so if you got your Bible, go ahead and get it out. If you got an electronic device, you need something to take notes. Because I'm going to share some things that I'm telling you could unlock some things for you today. I believe it could set you free today. You see, this idea we think of a comparison culture is not new to America. It's not new to social media. This has been going on for thousands of years. In fact, as long as there has been humanity, we have been constantly comparing ourselves with others. And what you find in in 2 Corinthians, in fact, I'll give you homework. Here's your your soul homework, is that you're going to read 2 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12 this week. And you're just going to chew on it. Because it it, it tells a portion of a story of a guy named Paul. Now, if you've never uh, heard of Paul, Paul is well known in the church. He actually wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. Uh, at one point, Paul was a religious elite who persecuted the church. And then he met Jesus, changed his life, flipped everything upside down. He started going around actually starting churches, to which he started this church in Corinth. And Paul would, uh, he was considered an apostle, which is somebody who starts works, okay, starts churches. And so he started a church, and then he would put someone in charge, and he'd leave and go to the next place. And so Paul would kind of have all these, like, spiritual churches, spiritual kids all around, and from time to time, he would write them when he would get report on what's going on. That's what you find in 2 Corinthians. What happened was, while Paul was gone, there was a group of elite, uh, um, they called apostles or leaders in the church world, that Paul refers to over and over as super apostles. Okay? It's like super pastors. It's like, you got, you, I'm a pastor. It'd be like, I'm gone for a while, and somebody who's a super pastor showed up. And the super pastor preaches, and the super pastor says, hey, everything that Paul was telling you is kind of like, nah, he doesn't really have it. He's not really with it. He, doesn't, he didn't go to school as long as I did. He doesn't understand the Bible like I do. So that's what happened. And there's a group of people that were coming in. They were kind of taking advantage of the church. And so Paul writes them a letter. Now, Paul kind of feels backed into a corner. Why? Because he feels like he's got to compare his accolades. He's got to compare himself with these super apostles because they've kind of like, they've kind of stopped listening to Paul and fallen away. And it's like, well, can we really trust Paul? And so he's backed into a corner. He feels like his leadership's called in question. And so Paul writes these words. Now, if you're, if you're looking at 2 Corinthians, we're going to start in chapter 11, verse 21. Paul says this. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about. Because these guys came in and they're like, oh, but, you know, Paul doesn't have all the, you know, stuff that we do. Paul says, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. If they're going to boast, I'm going to boast. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And I love this little phrase. I'm out of my mind to talk like this. 
He says, I am more. Now pause for just a moment. Okay, this is important. I want you to pick up the sarcasm in his letter and his voice. Paul is kind of just, he's kind of saying, look, these guys come in and they boast and they brag and we're good at this. And Paul, uh, who's Paul? We're better than Paul. You need to listen to us. And Paul comes in, he's like, fine, if they're going to boast, I'm going to boast. He feels like I got to compare. I got to measure up. And so he's, you know, just notice this. And then Paul, he does something really crazy. He kind of gives his list of accolades. Okay, all right, if they're so good and I know they're well trained and I know they speak well and I know they have history. All that, now, okay, fine. Here's my list. That's what we do. By the way, when you post, here, here's how I'm a good mom. Here's how I'm a good leader. Here's how I'm, that's what he's doing. He's, he's putting it out there. Look at verse 23. He said, I've worked much harder. All right, Paul. Okay, that's good. I work much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. Now, that's not something we would normally lead with. I got a record. Okay? He says, I've been flogged more severely and exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 for any math majors. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. Everybody wants to kill me. In danger in the city, danger in the country, danger in the sea, danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold. I've been naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul gives his exhaustive list of all of his accomplishments. Now, if I'm Paul, that's probably not what I'm leading with. Right? I'm going to say I started churches on three different continents. I, I planted these. There's this many people that are actually in churches. Because, no, 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 no. Paul doesn't do that. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to miss this. This is really important. Because I think Paul wants us to learn something today. That the things that we boast about, that we think matter so much to us, I think he wants us to learn they don't impress God. The things that we post about so that we can impress other people, he wants us to understand, does not impress God at all. I, I want you to consider this, right? Because we think that having a big following means a lot. Oh, I've got a lot of followers on my planet. I've got a lot of friends. You know what God thinks? God thinks, you know what matters? Having a big story to tell, not how big the audience is that hears it. That's what matters to God. We think money is impressive. God thinks integrity is impressive. Paul said, okay, fine, I'll boast. And then he begins to boast about his hardships, and he boasts about his pain, and he boasts about being weak, and he boasts. This is what Paul does. Why? Why? Because there's something that you'll discover when, when you lean into God. And when you read through the Bible, you're going to discover this. There is a paradox of power. This is what Paul's trying to show us. The things that we think make us strong, God would look at and say, that makes you weak. The things that we want to brag about, uh, God looks at and says, that's not impressive to me. There's a paradox of power. This, this is what I want you to see. This is why Paul also wrote earlier when he would write a letter to the church. He would say, the people who don't understand, who don't know God, they don't get it. They don't see this. This is why he would say this. He would say, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying, but it is power to those who are being saved. Paul is the one who would say that God uses the lowly things of this world to shame the lofty or the high. God uses the weak things of this world to shame that which is strong. This is what Paul wants us to understand. There's a paradox of power. The very things that we look at in our life and we say, I am weak here. That makes me weak. Maybe God wants us to see that maybe it's not as weak as you think. Paul flips the script. This is what I like about this moment. And, and talk about weakness. 
You know what the world says is weak? Paul would look at it and go, I don't consider that weak. I like what he said in verse 29 because I stopped you short of it. Verse 29, he said this, who is weak? I don't feel weak. Who is led into sin? I don't inwardly burn. Paul says, you want to talk about weakness? I'll give you a weakness. Those that cannot say no to temptation, I'll call that weak. That's what Paul said. And then in verse 30, I love this. This was a key verse for me. He said this, if I must boast, everybody say boast. If I must boast, he said, I will boast of the things that show my what? Everybody say it out loud. We'll show my, say it again. We'll show my. Paul said, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast about things that make me look bad. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast about things that show off my weaknesses. Let me, let me say it for you today. If I'm going to post, did I say but? No. If I'm going to post, I'm going to post things that show off my weaknesses. Nobody does that. If I'm going to post, I'm going to post the things that celebrate the things that I'm not really good at doing. What is he talking about? I think he wants us to see something. See, most of us will spend our entire lives downplaying suffocating, downplaying our weaknesses and exposing the few things that we're good at because I want everybody to look at me and I want them to, like, I want to compare myself. And I think what Paul wants to do is give us a new way to see our weaknesses. I want to give you a new way to see your weaknesses. God, God showed me something. This was so profound because I've been spending most of my time, especially when I'm in a position where I'm supposed to lead, that where I, I am trying to elevate my strengths and I'm trying to hide my weaknesses. I don't want my church to know that I'm struggling. I wouldn't want my church to know that I'm seeing a counselor. I wouldn't want my church to know that I might be struggling with depression. I wouldn't want my church to know that inside I'm actually kind of really struggling right now. And so what I've tried to do for many years is I want to display I'm strong and I'm stable. And I'm the kind of person that you can follow when all the time in the inside in my soul I was actually suffering. Because I, I don't want you to see my weaknesses. But then as I go on a journey, God begins to show me something, something so revelatory that it begins to change everything. Can I, can I show you what God showed me? Can I, show, I have an illustration. Can I get some help with my illustration? I, I, got, I got some illustration that I brought out. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, hey, by the way, everybody, this is Jay Bowser. Everybody give it up for Jay. <laughs> by the way, don't run off, don't run off. Jay here, by the way, is our... Uh, one of our newest employees here at X Church, a production director that we have needed so badly. And he and his wife Morgan and son Will are, have moved up from Charlotte, Carolina, North Carolina, all the way to balmy, sunny Columbus, Ohio to share their lives with us. So do me a favor. Today you see Jay running around. Go up and say hi. Give him a hug. Well, you can't do that. Give him a fist bump. Hey, love you, brother. We're glad you're here. Come on, give it up for Jay. We're so excited to have Jay. Uh, God showed me something when I was looking at this passage. Let, let's say that these jars represent you, okay? These jars represent you. That, that when you're made in God's image, that you're made with a brain, with a mental side, IQ. You're, you're made with the physical. We all have a body. Right? You're made to be emotional. We've been talking about that. Your emotional maturity, your, your soul, which covers your, you know, what we say, your heart and your will and your mind and your emotional. And then, and then we all have a personality. You know how everybody's unique and everybody's different and they're bubbly and they're an Enneagram 6 and they're this and they're that. We all have kind of a unique makeup. That's what I'm saying, okay? There's kind of a unique makeup. And so what, what I want you to see is that when God was getting ready to create you out of the, the dirt. Well, God made mankind and he formed them out of the, the dirt, the dust. Um, God was going to put you together. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are complex. You're a mystery because God put you together. And so here's what that means, that God took some dirt and he used it to, to make you, to fashion you. 
And I know, like, just go with the illustration. If you're a woman, you're going, yeah, but God took Adam's rib, and then he fashioned a woman out of it and made her even better than the dirt. I, I get all that. Just go with my illustration. Some of you biblical nerds. Uh, and so, so there's only 100% of you. And when God started, he's like, I got a jar of you that I have to, I have to put together. And we're all different. We're all unique. Seven and a half plus billion people on this planet, and there's no one else like you. It's because God chose how to put you together. And so, so, there, so God might have been looking at you when he was creating you, and he's like, all right, you need a brain. And so he's like, I'm going I'm to give you, let's give you, some of you are like, can, can God put a little bit more of that in there? I need, and so God's, God's going to give you a brain, you know. And, uh, well, maybe a little bit more than that because you got to pass school and, you, you know, you got this career ahead of you. And, and, so, uh, and so you got to have a brain and then you obviously have to have a body. And so, you know, God's got to, you know, but you're a little short, so it's not very much. Uh, so, you know, that, that's unfortunate. Uh, and, and then, you know, emotional. You're somebody that God was like, you know, this person's got a lot of heart. You know, like, like man, they're, you know, I mean, and, and they're kind of emotional and sometimes difficult, you know what I mean? But, but you know, they feel deeply. Let's just say that this is, we'll call this Dave. And, and Dave is, you know, he's got, he's got some room to grow, but he's, he's got a brain. He's a little short. Okay, Dave's a little short. He could use a little, you know, a little bit more. He doesn't have big muscles, not real strong. Uh, he's a bit emotional, okay, kind of a mess a lot, you know. Um, he does have a good personality, though. I mean, people like him. I think God often gives people that are emotional, uh, you know, a good personality, or we wouldn't like him at all. And uh, so, you know, a good personality, and, you know, God's putting them together, and he's like, you know, he probably is going to need help to get through college. So let's give Dave a little bit more, just because I'm worried that he's not going to make it into the career that I would love him to be in. And, uh, you know, actually, like, he's really emotional. He loves uh, movies that make him cry. And, uh, you know, he just, you know, he's, he's tender. Dave's tender. And, uh, and so this, this is you. This is you, Dave. God put you together. God gave me this picture when I was, I was reading through this passage one day. Because a lot of times what we do is, is we see the area that we don't have a lot of kind of short and stubby and I don't have abs and, uh, you know, I don't, you know, and, and here's what's interesting. Okay, Dave got shorted in this category. I mean, God gave him a lot here, but he shorted, he shorted him here. And, and you know what I found is that the world tends to value certain things more than others. Are you following me? The world tends to put a, a higher value. See, Dave didn't do real well in high school. Not, not because he wasn't smart. He did actually really well, and he actually did better than I did on the SAT test and all this stuff. But, but he didn't do well in high school because in high school, you know what matters? How big you are and how athletic you are. And, oh, you're a starter on the football team. And, oh, you, got the, you get the girls. See, Dave, he, he, he always was jealous of the athletes and the jocks, and he tried out for the basketball team every single year in high school. And his senior year, they finally felt so bad, they put him on JV. And, uh, and so Dave always would compare himself with, with everybody else, and it was never good enough. It was never good enough. But God only has so much to work with, 100% of you, Right? And, and God began to show me something because a lot of times we get discouraged by, by what we see. I wish I had more of this, but I would love to sit and tell Dave something. Just like when you look at your weaknesses, I would love to sit and tell you something. That in order for God to, to maybe, I know, I know it feels like he shorted me on this, but could it be that because of Dave's purpose that God gave more here? Because God had a calling and a purpose 
on Dave's life that was going to require him to have a soul and to feel deeply because he was going to care for people and he was going to love people. And what the world puts value on right here, God says, yeah, but I know the purpose that I made Dave for. And I had to give Dave more of this. And there's only so much to go around. And so if I'm going to give Dave this and he's going to have a great personality here and he's going to be really smart, I might have to short him a little bit here. And why does this matter? This is because listen, here's what God showed me. That my weakness in one area might actually account for my strengths in a different area. I might not be great here, but it could just be that God gave me more somewhere else. I would love for us to get this because this is what we do. We spend our lives, here's what we do. We see our weaknesses, and we spend our entire lives comparing our weaknesses to somebody else's strength. Well, he's stronger, and he's bigger, and he's better looking, and he... You know what we never do? We never compare our weakness. We never compare, listen, we never compare our weaknesses to somebody else's strengths in a different area. We compare them to somebody else's strengths in that area. We never go, well, I know I didn't get much of this, but he's a jock. Well, he's a dumb jock. (laughs) And women are going to find him annoying after a while. I know he looks chiseled now, but I'm going to treat him right. We we don't do that. Do you you know what I found that I I hate? You ever... ever you ever uh, get jealous and you say, you, you look at somebody and you go, I mean, I don't like that person. And you say, because they're the total package. Have you ever thought when you look, because, you know, we look at social media influencers and, you know, it's like, well, she's, she's beautiful and she can sing and she's got a lot of followers and she's fit. And so you look at her and you go, I wish I was her. And, and. But you only see the filtered version of that person. You don't actually see the other areas. And what you're doing is you're comparing your weaknesses to their strength. God gave them a strength in that area. But what gets, guess what? What they will never show you? They'll never show you their weaknesses. Because we filter them. How do I know this is true? Because this Dave, there was a Dave in the Bible. That by the way, when it came to the categories that God gave, was kind of short, was kind of little was kind of small, he was overlooked, and when God sent the prophet Samuel to go anoint the next king after Saul because God had rejected Saul, and he goes to Jesse's family in Bethlehem, and he says, line up your sons, and Jesse lines up his sons from the oldest down to the youngest. As soon as Samuel saw the oldest, Eliab, he said, oh, that must be the one God chose because he's taller than everybody else, because he's better looking, because he's stronger. That must be the one that God's anointed, and God said, no. He said, man looks at the physical, the outward appearance, but God looks on the inside. The inside. What the world celebrates and says is everything. God says, no, 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 I have rejected him. The one that you pick is the one I've rejected. And he went down through the line, and they couldn't find the one. And so Samuel had to ask Jesse, don't you have any other sons? Oh, yeah, there's a guy named Dave. But he's out in the field. He's the youngest. He's the weakest. He's the smallest. Oh, yes, Dave, you don't want Dave. And God says, that's the one I want. I'm trying to get you to see something that has been the reason why you have not been able to love yourself for so long. It's because your weaknesses just do not compare to other people's strengths in those areas. And I know some of you are thinking, but I wish I had a different makeup. I'm fine. I could, I could, I could do without the crying. I wish I was a little, little better looking and... I wish I was at least smarter. I I know a lot of us think, but I wish I had a different makeup. I wish I did. Can I just tell you something? God did not mess up when he created you. Can I say that again? God did not mess up when he created you. He did not mess up. God put you together for a specific purpose when he put you together. And the reason why we struggle when we see our weaknesses is because we don't understand the gospel. 
I need to show you this because Paul gave us a secret. 2 Corinthians 12, just a few verses down. We're going to close. We're going to close in a minute. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Here, this is so important. Here's Paul talking about what I boast in. And and then Paul gives us a secret when we get down to verse 7 of chapter 12. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, there's all these things that God has given me I could brag about, all this strength. But in order to keep me from being conceited, there was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. You know, some have suggested over and over, they have, um, they've, they've guessed at what was possibly Paul's thorn in his flesh. A messenger of Satan. You, you know, sometimes we, we think that it was maybe physical. Some people say, well, I think maybe he had a physical illness. Maybe he had kidney stones, and it just kind of crippled him, and he, they never went away. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and God never took him away. Some, something that could be mental. You know, in fact, if you read all of 2 Corinthians, what you'll discover, he starts off by talking about, I was in a place of deep depression and despair, even though so much that I wanted to die. So I think it was that he battled with a constant, and maybe it was that kind of like the messenger that speaks lies into his mind. Uh, some people thought, it, maybe, some people think that maybe it was physical, it was mental, emotional. Uh, I, I wonder if maybe Paul, the way he saw himself, you know, we think that Paul, maybe there was this person that ran around and constantly posted negative things about him. It was just kind of always harassing him. I don't know if it was those. You know, sometimes the, the greatest messenger of Satan is not a person around you, but it's the one within you. Because Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 10.10, you know, people say about me, they say in his letters, they're weighty forceful but in person he's unimpressive and he doesn't speak well so maybe it was that Paul you know I don't know we don't know what was this thing that afflicted Paul and you know what can I just say I'm glad we didn't know what Paul wrestled with because here's what I know that was Paul's struggle but Paul's struggle is not Tim's struggle and Paul's struggle isn't your struggle and so I'm glad we don't know because maybe we are able to find our say, ourselves in this in this moment and so here's what he says look at this verse 9 says, this was God's response after he said, take it away from me. But God said to me, my what? Everybody say that word out loud. My, come on, say it again. My is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in what? Weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. He says this. Everybody say that last line out loud with me. For when I am weak, then I am. I don't know if you saw it. Can I tell you how much this unlocked me? Can I tell you how much this took chains off of my soul? I don't know if you saw it, but here's Paul saying, you know what, I I wanted to hide my weaknesses, but what God showed me was that his grace is sufficient for me. Can I just tell you what it's really done in me is I've gotten to a place where I've stopped trying to hide my weaknesses from my staff, from my church. I've gotten to this place where I stopped trying to act like I have it all together and I know everything and I'm the smartest person in the room and I'm the best leader and I'm the best. I've stopped doing that because I've realized this truth in my life that the areas where God did not give me as much, he gave me more in other areas because that's my purpose and because God wants to use the area see he's tilted it in the favor of other places and God will tilt it in the favor of other places where you will find your purpose so that you can use your strengths to encourage someone so what about my weaknesses what am I supposed to do about my weaknesses that's what God showed me I got excited about this I'm sorry if you don't get excited about it maybe you haven't been on the journey that I've been on I get excited about it. What did God say? He said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. And then he said this, my power is made perfect in your what? My power. So what if God says, I made you and I know you're weak in that area. Because I made you that way. I just wish I had more of God. says, no, 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 no. I gave you someplace else 
And I know you're, you say, well, I feel weak there. Oh, I know you do. But this space, Dave, this is the grace space. This is the gap. This is the God gap. Every place of your life where you feel like I don't measure up and I'm weak and I don't really like myself and I just don't think I'm very good and I see everybody else has more than I do. That is the space that is the gap that God says, oh, but I will take and my power will be made perfect in your weaknesses. So that area that you say, I don't have very much, God says, oh yeah, well that's the area now where I can show up in power in your life. Oh, by the way, maybe day, this same Dave that was the smallest and the weakest, maybe God intended for him to be the smallest and the weakness, weakest because when he would go out and face a giant who had all the physical attributes of the world, but he would take a sling and he would take a stone and he would take down the giant. Guess who gets the glory? Not David, but God, because God's power is made perfect in my weakness. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Come on, stand to your feet. Come on, stand to your feet. I'm closing, I'm closing. I needed to reframe for you your weaknesses. I needed you to see yourself differently. Because most of you, what's crushing your soul is living in a constant state of comparison with everybody else and always feeling like I don't have enough. Can I just tell you something? You have enough, you are enough. God created you that way. And then he's going to say, I'm going to show up in power in this area of your life where there's deficiency, the gap. God says, I'm going to show up. Listen, and the area that you want to filter the most is the area God wants to fill the most. Please hear this. The area that you want to filter, I don't want anybody else to see. God says, that's the area I want to fill. I want to do something in that area of your life. And so stop Hiding our weaknesses. Men, stop hiding your weaknesses from your wife. Stop hiding your weaknesses from your kids. Stop hiding your weaknesses from your uh, co-workers. Ladies, stop hiding your weaknesses from your other friends and other moms. And I'm not as good as this. Because listen, when you can say, God made me good in this. I may not be good with a wrench, but I'm pretty good with a microphone. It's because that's the way God made me. That's the purpose that God created me for. And I may not be good in some areas, but it's because God made me better in other areas. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. God, I know that you want to unlock some things in people's souls today. God, I believe in this word, this message, because God, you have unlocked my soul in this area. And so God, I pray right now for every person that struggled with a battle of comparison, of not feeling like they're enough. Listen, I want to have a moment of response here. every head bowed and every eye closed I I really want this to be a personal moment between you and God God's speaking to you right now if there's an area of your soul where you have just you feel like you're not enough constantly living in the shadows always feel like you don't measure up if that's something that you felt the weight of in your life Let's stop hiding our weaknesses. I want to ask you to do me a favor. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask God by his spirit to set you free today. If that's you today, this message has really been speaking to you all across this room. Online, you can, you can let us know as well if you want. But I would ask for you, if that's you, I want to pray for you. Would you just lift your hand up and hold your hand up right now? Hands going up all over the place. Be honest. This is the moment we stop hiding our weaknesses, guys. This is the moment where we say, I've been struggling with this. Father, I just pray right now for every single person right now, God, who is saying, I'm done hiding my weaknesses. God, I realize that you created me. And there are some things I'm good at, but there are some things, God, that I feel like I'm not good enough. God, I thank you for, Lord, your strength. And I thank you, God, for your grace. I pray right now, God, grace to fill the gaps. I pray, God, that your power would fill the gaps. I pray, God, for a new lease on life today. 
I pray, God, that today people are going to be set free in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, right now that your spirit right now is filling every single deficiency, every gap, every area, God, where we do not feel like we're enough. I pray right now, God, your spirit would meet. Your spirit would fill the area.